Hi everyone, it's On The Run time. A very special On The Run right here from day three of G2E Asia. We're here at the Privileges Lounge, sponsored by Mega Fortress. And we've got with us, Olivia. How are you, Olivia? I'm great. Hi everyone. But is it the real Olivia? Let's find out after the plane. Well, welcome back everybody. That was a bit of fun with Olivia. Always looking for an opportunity to promote our clients and ourselves, of course. Okay, well back to on the run and uh, greetings from uh, here at G2E Asia, we're here at the Venetian, uh, right here in Macau, and it's day three, late on day three, and everybody's just starting to, to pack up, so we've got about 20 or 30 minutes left, which is plenty of time for us to shoot on the run. Uh, so let's get into the stories of the week, and as we usually do, let's start with Macau, especially given that we're here in Macau. And this week, JP Morgan came out and said that Macau's mass is uh, likely to reach pre-COVID levels by October. They did their daily channel checks. They said their daily run rate, or they estimated the current daily run rate at around 66 million US dollars. So 66 million times 30 is, what's that? That's uh, 660, triple that, that's 2 billion. 24 billion, that's what we've been coming in at roughly 1.8, 1.9 billion per month. So they believe that mass GGR is running at around 90% of pre-COVID levels. And yeah, if we get back to uh, pre-COVID levels by October, things will be going even better than they are now. Uh, the MGTO uh, director, uh, Helena, came out and said 11.6 million visitor arrivals in the first half of the year. Uh, that comes out to be around 64,000 per day. Compare that to the 2019 average of 108,000 per day. And she also said that Macau's hotel occupancy last weekend was running at 89% uh, across all of Macau, which of course means that many of the hotels were at 100% and that uh, over the weekend we had over 100,000 visitors per day. So we're starting to get up to that 100,000 visitors per day number uh, in Macau. Um, we also had the Jackie Chung uh, residency. There was a bit of news about that this week. Um, uh, Wilfred Wong, Dr. Wilfred Wong came out and said that it was a boost to the Macau economy and there was some agreement by the commentariat about that. Of course, everyone knows Jackie Chung, very famous Canto pop star. Uh, originally, six shows were planned, but that was very quickly sold out. They doubled it to 12. Um, so over the last month, he's done these 12 shows to 109,000 fans at the Kotai Arena. So 109,000 divided by 12, that's a little, uh, little under 10,000 fans per show. Uh, for a dozen shows is, is pretty good indeed. So, you know, these shows and entertainment, we've had Blackpink, we've had Jackie Chung, we've had others. Uh, Macau is really starting to get there in terms of shows and entertainment kicking in again in the new normal after the 8th of January, which is fantastic. Uh, next bit of news, uh, G2E Asia holds the first uh, Macau show for more than four years, or for four years. Um, actually, it is more than four years because it's July and it's normally in May, isn't it? So May 2019 was the last one. Here we are now in July. Uh, uh, did I say 2021? I think I said, if I did, I meant to say 2019. May 2019 was the last one. That's where I got the one from. And now, of course, it's July 2023, so it's a little over four years later. And here we are finally at G2E Asia in Macau. Now, of course, this show was split between G2E Asia in Macau and this new brand that they've created, the Asian IR Expo, which is focusing on uh, non-gaming. Uh, IAG was the lead media and production partner for G2E Asia. We just focused on the gaming side. Uh, and also this follows the Singapore G2E Asia that was just six weeks ago. Uh, to be frank, some consternation about why was there two shows and further still why, some consternation around the splitting of the Macau show even further between G2E Asia and Asian IR Expo. A lot of people saying they, that they hope things go back to so-called normal uh, next year, which was just one show per year held in May and held in Macau. Let's see what happens at this stage, no decisions um, have been made. Uh, we had IAG, we had the, our first ever The Industry Party. We had it last night, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, over 200 people were there, uh, lots and lots of orange, everything was branded orange. 
and it was really, really good. Uh, traditionally, there always has been a combined industry style party uh, on the second day of G2E Asia, and uh, we decided just to call it the industry party, which makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I just want to say thank you to um, all the sponsors, and yes, I am going to list them out. Uh, Akata Manila was our diamond sponsor, uh, Light & Wonder was our platinum sponsor, and we had six uh, gold sponsors. Here we go, I'm doing them off the top of my head, let's see if I can get it right. Um, uh, uh, Angel, uh, APT, Aristocrat, IGT, uh, LT Game, and WDT, yes, uh, Walker Digital, our six gold sponsors. So thank you to all of those eight sponsors. Thank you too to MGM, really big special thank you to MGM. We held it at the Vista at MGM Kotai and they went above and beyond. They really did a, a great job in looking after us. Everyone from the senior management were, were, were on side with what we were doing, right down to the, the most junior serving staff were on their A game last night. Everyone had a, just a great night. And finally, I wanna say thank you to you. A lot of the people watching this video would have attended the party and it was fantastic for your support. So thank you and after the success of that, uh, we will be doing an industry party, the, the so-called orange party, as we've been calling it internally, uh, on day two of any major trade show in Macau. That's our intention. We plan to do that. Okay, let's move on. So during G2E, uh, Hubert Wang, the uh, COO of, or pro, sorry, pro president, I should say, of, um, of MGM China, I spoke at a very interesting panel on the afternoon of day one and made a couple of comments that we turned into stories. The first comment that he made was that the foreigner only zones are likely transitional. That was his view. He felt that it would be better if foreigners, so-called foreigners, people who are not from Hong Kong, not from mainland China, not from Taiwan, were able to play anywhere they liked and they weren't restricted to be in these foreigner only zones. And he said, as long as the, the properties were able to prove to the government that it was foreign play and that it was auditable and it was trackable, why not let foreigners play wherever they liked, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the second story we uh, created from his talk was uh, he made comments that junkets were now comprising as little as 3% of GGR at MGM. So traditional um, corporate junkets or external junkets now a very, very small part of their business. And uh, after his comments, uh, uh, we went and grabbed him and, and he, was, he spoke exclusively to IAG and he revealed that um, there are 30 odd licensed junket operators uh, now in Macau. He said that the DICJ allowed MGM eight of those. He then went on to say that fewer of the eight are actually operating and only two are bringing in any meaningful business. So they're really only working with two junket operators. It's a very small part of their business now and even if it disappeared, it probably wouldn't make much of a difference. So he didn't say that, that's my comment. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Light and Wonder uh, installs for the first time their Cascada cabinet in Macau. This is great to see the whole the whole buying of slot machine equipment by the operators in Macau dried up completely during COVID, and it was looking very very bad there for suppliers in the industry for a while. So this is. You might think it's not such a big story, but you know what? It is a big story because it means Macau's back and it means Macau uh, operators, the IR operators are buying from the suppliers. So business, the whole economy, the whole ecosystem is, is back working again, which is fantastic. So it's both the Light & Wonder Cascada dual screen and the Cascada portrait cabinets. They're in the Macau IRs for the first time. Uh, Light & Wonder didn't say which IRs, but not hard to find out and they're fully uh, 2.0 compliance, which is great. Uh, next story, Macau's court dismisses uh, Sun City's Alvin Chow's appeals. Uh, Alvin Chow made um, three appeals to the court in Macau uh, relating to his 18 year sentence. All the appeals were on technical grounds relating to evidence. All of them were dismissed and look, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you get charged with something in Macau and it gets to court, the conviction rate is very, very high. There's, uh, there's not much chance of a not guilty verdict and there's not much chance of a lenient sentence either. Pretty tough for Macau courts. So uh, Mr. Chow, unfortunately, is serving an 18 year sentence and we try not to talk about that too much and go on about that story too much, but it was newsworthy that he had appealed and the appeals had been knocked back. 
now over to Manila and or over to the Philippines, I should say, and still uh, talking about legal and court matters. We had a big breaking news uh, yesterday on Wednesday. I'm shooting this on Thursday afternoon. You may be watching it on Friday morning uh, at 11.42 a.m. yesterday, uh, noting that IAG does put the times of publishing on our stories. Uh, we had a breaking news that uh, Kazuo Okada and uh, Tody Boy uh, Konguanga and uh, various other associates of Kazuo Okada um, that arrest warrants were issued. Uh, this was advised to us by Okada Manila. They contacted us and, and told us this and it was uh, for something called qualified theft, which is a, a legal term in, in the Philippines that means theft uh, which involves a grave abuse of confidence and that kind of theft is subject to higher penalties. And apparently, according to Ricardo Manila, the theft is, involves the theft of around 500 million pesos from the Ricardo Manila cage in 2022 during that time. Regular IAG readers will remember that time that uh, Ricardo and his uh, associates kind of stormed Ricardo Manila and took over the property for a while. They were eventually um, ousted. So 500 million a peso, uh, what's that? Divide by about 50, so that's 10 uh, million uh, US dollars or a little less, because it's more like 55 the exchange rate now, isn't it? But still a significant amount of cash, and let's see how that transpires and see if Mr. Okada is actually arrested. Uh, still in the Philippines, the PNP, which is the Philippines National Police, they want to join PADCOR on these uh, pogo raids they're on. Uh, a lot of pogo raids, regular readers of IAG will know that there's been a lot of, a lot of um, PADCOR activity and raiding these pogos to make sure they're complying with the law. But the National Police want to get involved because it's not just things that PADCOR are interested in, like paying the right taxes and following their license requirements. There's actually illegal activity going on in some of these POGOs and the police uh, want to be part of it. So um, I'm sure that they, the agencies in the Philippines will try and work together and we'll see what comes of that. Down to Australia now and Len Ainsworth, a very, very famous figure in Australia and the world actually for slot machines, the founder of Aristocrat and the founder of Ainsworth. A little bit later on, he turned 100 years old this week and uh, he gave an interview to the Australian newspaper. And in there, of course, again, regular readers of IAG will understand the current operating environment, regulatory environment in Australia is uh, one in which basically as, as Ben in the story that he wrote said that all things gambling are the devil of the day. I thought that was a good expression and it summed it up quite well. And uh, of course, Len Ainsworth is completely associated with slot machines or pokies as they're called in Australia. And when asked how he felt about, you know, being sort of typecast as the devil, he was very belligerent and said, I don't mind. And besides which they can all go get stuffed. So he doesn't care and he's a hundred years old. So why would he care? So. You know, let's say happy birthday to Len Ainsworth. Uh, if I get to be that old, I'll be very happy indeed. Uh, still in Australia, uh, the federal court approved uh, the $450 million uh, penalties to Crown, the Crown Austrac settlement. Now, this was actually very poorly reported by some media. A lot of media doesn't understand gaming and uh, they make these, they report things poorly and then people say things. There were actually so called experts at G2E this week just making statements based upon incorrect media reports. Uh, first of all, these were not fines, this was a settlement between Austrac. Austrac is the financial regulator in Australia, uh, between Austrac and, uh, and Crown. The court did uh, term it penal did call it a penalty, but these were not, were, were not fines imposed under uh, particular legislation or whatever. It was, it was a settlement to basically Crown and Austrac have agreed to no further prosecution, that Crown has, has paid enough to, to make this all go away. The penalty for Crown Melbourne is 300 million Australian. Uh, the penalty for Crown Perth is 150 uh, Australian. Divide these numbers by, or multiply these numbers by two thirds to get US dollars. And Crown will be required to pay 125 million Australian within 28 days, a further 125 million uh, within 12 months, and then the balance of 200 million in two years. And Kieran Carruthers, the CEO of Crown Resorts, 
uh, said that these judgments, federal court judgments, uh, to quote him, quote unquote, bring to an end the historical AML CTF failures at Crown. Well, we hope, that, certainly hope that they do. And they were, all these failures were uh, before his time. So it's his job to clean all this up and uh, hopefully Crown can manage to do that. Over to Cambodia now, a place I was at a few weeks ago, uh, very interesting jurisdiction, Cambodia. Um, Cambodia welcomed 2.48 million air passengers in the first half of the year. So what's 0.02 of a million between friends? Let's call it 2.5 million. They're targeting 5 million for the year, so another 2.5 million in the second half of the year. That is still less than the pre-pandemic uh, years, but it is a 270% year-on-year increase. So the Cambodian tourism industry is coming back and good luck to them and that's good for the industry there. In another interesting story uh, this week out of Russia, uh, there's the construction of a 34 million, that's US dollar, 34 million US dollar ho uh, hotel casino in the Primor uh, district is going to start in September. The Primorsky Krai Development Corporation came out and uh, advised this. So this is one of the few areas of Russia, there's about three I think, areas in all of Russia that allows gaming and one or two of them even don't have any gaming at all in them yet. Um, but anyway, this, this $34 million property, the first stage is due for completion in August 2025. We had a couple of interesting halts of Russian development in recent year or so. Uh, Nagakorp was planning something in the same area. The, the, this area is all around Vladivostok, uh, in the far, far east of Russia on the, on the coast near the border with China. And so Nagacorp halted their plans and even the existing Tigre de Cristal, uh, which is owned by Summit Ascent, which is already operating in Russia, in Vladivostok, they put on hold their expansion plans. And of course, all of this putting on hold is no doubt because of the Russian-Ukrainian war and the sanctions against Russia. So Russia's not exactly flavor of the month in the international community right now. So that's what that's all about. Now let's go to Cyprus where Melco's uh, COD Mediterranean celebrated its opening. Congratulations to COD. This has been a very long time coming. Europe's first true integrated resort, I think it's fair to say. And uh, this Cyprus property, COD Mediterranean, it opened on Monday. Of course, the Melco Resort's chairman and CEO, Lawrence Hope, was there. It is a 600 million euro resort. Uh, owned 75% by Melco and 25% by a local firm, CPZ, or CPZ if you're American, and it has a 14-storey hotel with 500 rooms. Boy, there's some real noise going on around here. They're, they're deconstructing the whole, uh, the whole of G2E as we speak, even though there's still five minutes to go. Uh, and uh, hopefully the microphone's picking me up and not all the construction noise. But anyway, let's, we're nearly done, let's continue on. Um, just two uh, poker stories uh, this, this month that was very interesting. The WSOP smashed its all-time record uh, for the main event with over 10,000 starters uh, just this last week. I'm, I'm a regular player of the WSOP main event, the World Series of Poker main event. Didn't do it this year, too busy catching up from the post-COVID stuff. But this is the most number of entrants since 2006, 17 years ago. That was the year that famously there were 8,773 starters and Jamie Gold ran over the final table that year to win the biggest prize ever in the history of poker. Well, biggest prize, I should say biggest prize for the, for the World Series main events. Uh, there have been bigger prizes in certain super high rollers, but this is the one that everybody wins. This is universally acknowledged as the most important poker tournament in the world every year, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, undisputably. So that's fantastic and it shows that uh, poker is back uh, and gaming generally is back and it's offline bricks and mortar poker. So it shows that even though lots and lots of gaming and things generally in the world are going online, the online encourages the offline version of that as a, as a higher level of whatever that activity is, as, as the epitome or the ultimate of whatever that activity is. Just as, um, just as video cassettes, renting video cassettes made uh, cinema uh, an art form again and people love going to the cinema, I think online gaming is going to, is going to promote offline gaming. Uh, in the world and here's a great example of it so congratulations to Caesars the owners of the WSOP on that still on poker uh, the founder of PokerStars Isai Scheinberg 
uh, was honoured by the WPT, the World Poker Tour, and was given a WPT Honours Award, which is the highest accolade the WPT has. Uh, both Isai and Vince Van Patten, uh, one half of the famous commentary duo for the WPT, were honoured, and the two of them become the eighth and the ninth so honoured since these honours began in 2017. So in six years, there's only been nine people given this, and Isai is a very, very worthy recipient of this. Uh, very, very clearly, he's probably done the most of any human being on the planet to promote poker. I mean, poker stars really was the gold standard online poker website. I think I can say that without a shadow of a doubt. It's not been what it was since Isai sold it. And when he, Isai and his son Mark, the Scheinbergs, were running Poker Stars, it was just a, a fantastic website that really, really stood for the players, not necessarily profit. Of course, they made huge profits, uh, but they could have made more if they wanted to to kind of do bad things to the players, but they always had the players in the front of their mind, and that's absolutely fantastic. So congratulations to Isai Scheinberg. He's been through a lot, and um, it's a, a very worthy honor for him. So after about three or four weeks in Macau, it's time for me to really go on the run again uh, next week. Towards the second half of next week, I'm gonna hit the road uh, first to Manila. I've got some things to do in Manila. I'll only be there for around a week this time and then I'm heading down to Australia for quite some time. I'm planning to visit as many as five cities in Australia. And of course that will involve AGE in August. So I'll be going to AGE in Sydney in August and who knows where else I'll be going. Uh, I'll figure it out and you will be the first to know what I know at On The Run next week. Well, that's it for this week and we will see you next time. Have a great weekend and bye for now. See ya. Run.